Hello and welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. I'm your host, Andrew Cram, and I'm really excited for this episode. It is with DK, who is an overall wizard when it comes to music, business, anything in those orbiting fields all together. He is a producer, a mixer, a studio owner, a podcaster, a children's book author. The list goes on, and he's just one of those people that finds something that he loves, breaks it down, learns about it, and masters it so quickly. And that's exactly what I wanted to talk to him about. I had originally heard an interview of his where he guested on another podcast and basically shared how to make like a million dollar podcast consultant company and shared a lot of what he did with his company, Launchpod Media. And I thought that was so cool that he was willing to share information and not be gatekeepy and was so genuinely helpful. Eventually I hit him up and I was like, yo, I, I want to hear everything. I want to talk to you. I want to get to know you. And he was kind enough to come on the show. I had so many questions and we got into such a crazy in-depth podcast where we go from talking about the meaning of life and all of this crazy philosophy into his wild upbringing and traveling around and how he got to be where he's at now. And we talk about actionable tips and things that people can apply to get into any of the industries that I listed. So it was uh, an episode with a lot of pulp. So uh, I'll, I'll probably ramble if I say anything else. Let's just get right into it. Enjoy. Where are all my friends? DK, this is an episode I told you a little bit right before we started recording, but you've kind of been on my radar as one of those people that I really respect and I see what you're doing from afar to a degree. Like I don't know, and I genuinely want to learn your story on this podcast, but from every little bit, from the bits of your podcast that I've listened to, from what I've seen of like what you're putting out online, I respect what you're doing so much and your brilliant mind of being able to take ideas and actually turn them into businesses. And I want to hear everything. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be on. And uh, I'm grateful that you think that. You know? Dude, <laughs> I, I really do. Like, I, I'll say this story because it gives a little bit of context. But right around the beginning of the pandemic, my friend sent me a podcast and it was the six figure creative or I think home studio at the time. It was an episode that you did and you so brilliantly broke down this incredible business model that like if somebody had taken that and just followed it, like literally everything that you so openly shared, they could have made a million dollars like brilliant. And you're just like, yeah, dude, I don't want to gatekeep like this is this idea. This is how it started. And I'm like, this is the first time I've listened to a podcast. And I'm like, I like look around me and I'm like, is this like a joke? Like the what's the catch? This is too good. <laughs> and I really respected you for that. Like, I love people that will share information and share their story. Um, and that like really, really stood out to me. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That was a really fun episode. I think we did it 2020, 2021. I think it was 2020. It had to have been 20. Dude, yeah. I think like, I remember in that episode, they were talking. They're like, well, it looks like this thing is shutting down. We'll see. Like, it was like. Oh, that's yeah, right. Dude. So this must have been like mid 2020 as well. Because I think I it was before I moved to L.A. Oh, whoa. So I moved to L.A. two years ago. So it must have been the beginning of 2020 or like end of 2019. Oh, where were you Actually, before that? This was a, I was in Utah for five years. Oh, OK, OK. Yes, yeah, so I did school there. I finished up school there. I didn't graduate. I <laughs> Sick. <laughs> but uh, uh, did did school there, started a bunch of companies out there, and then my first studio out there as well. Oh, wow. And so that's kind of where I got my first start. Utah has a really, really great like startup scene. Interesting. It's very unique in many different ways, like culturally, but the workforce is strong and everybody's really well educated. And I mean, it's a bunch of Mormons who don't drink or smoke or party. So yeah. it's, like, it's like really reliable people. <laughs> yeah, like, like <laughs> just off the statistics alone, yeah. <laughs> you'll probably get some people that'll dedicate yeah. themselves. And so it, it was a really, really great place to kind of, you know, dig my toes into like the entrepreneur startup scene. And yeah. like really, it was a really safe place to like, for lack of better terms, like fuck up a lot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Were you... Where were you born? Like, where did you grow up? So I was born in Okinawa, Japan. Oh, no shit. You were born in Japan? Yeah. So I'm, I'm technically an immigrant. I moved to Chicago when I was around four or five. Um, and I lived in various suburbs around Chicago for 10 years. And then I did high school in Virginia. Uh, went back to live in Japan for like a church service thing for two years. I lived in Nagoya or like Aichiken, uh -huh. <laughs> Aichi Prefecture. And uh, so it's like the first time I ever went to mainland Japan because I'm like from Okinawa. So yeah. like I am like island boy 
like Polynesia of Japan. Like we weren't wow. part of Japan until World War II. Like that's Whoa. why I have a facial hair. That's why I have facial hair. That's why I'm brown. <laughs> and like, you know, Japanese people don't even think that I'm Japanese. Whoa. Because I'm half Caucasian. Yeah. And I don't look Caucasian. Yeah, and then you also don't look Japanese. And I'm half Okinawan. Japanese. And Okinawans wow. aren't like typically Japanese looking either. So uh, we always joke, my business partner who's like super Mexican, he's always joking. He's like, bro, you look more Mexican than I do. You know, you know like, <laughs> And, and uh, I took French in high school, which was a dumb mistake. Oh my God. So people just cannot figure you out. It's oh, just, it's everything. Yo, it's, it's crazy. So that's a, that's a whole thing in its own. But that I learned to love music in Chicago because uh, around middle school, when everybody kind of really gets into music, uh, there was a DJ 96.3. His name was Julian on the radio, uh -huh. like this Korean Asian dude that like hosted this radio show was playing like 2000s hits. So like my foundational music, other yeah. than from my parents, like my personal foundational music was like Kanye, Neo. Yes. You know, like yeah. Soldier Boy was part of it kind of. Yeah. Usher, Chris Brown. So like Rihanna, like that was yeah. my foundational stuff. My parents didn't listen to any rock at all. Mm -hmm. So like I just assumed anything that wasn't reggae, because reggae was popular in Japan. Like anything yeah. that wasn't oh, really? reggae was just like heavy metal screaming like and i didn't really i it was so bad to the point where i always say like i didn't know who acdc was until guitar hero like wow. i did until guitar hero 3 when my friend invited me over i was like oh like what is this dude i think about guitar hero 3 so often with how much that like actually like formed certain music discovery oh yeah like insane it, it's so insane it, it <laughs> this is how crazy it is okay Please. like this is this is gonna blow your mind i listened to wonderwall by oasis for the first time less than a year ago stop it i'm dead serious what did you like i probably heard it in passing but like that was the first time i've let, re listened to it like recognizing this is called wonderwall by oasis what's the review do you like it is okay it good? <laughs> There's a lot that I can say of this, and I get a lot of hate for this, but I'm still going to stand by it. Like, right. as a first-time listener with no background, yeah, it's mediocre at best. <laughs> like, and people will be like, I hate you. We're not friends anymore. I'm like, wow. but I, yeah, it's funny. And and that's because I have no, like, nostalgia with it. Right. There's yeah. no sense of nostalgia. Yeah, you literally are just like, oh, acoustic song, I guess. Cool. Yeah. That's so I think that goes into crazy. like something that you could talk talk about potentially, which is like the importance of like playlisting and getting discovered. Yeah, yeah. And like having those first initial plays and maybe even like the importance of like videos and music videos and how there's like a psychological attachment with liking music more if there's like yeah. an image attached to it or something like that. I don't no, know. Yeah, it, that's, I'm a weird one with that too because a lot of my music discovery, I didn't, like we didn't have cable when I was growing up. So mm -hmm. you didn't have MTV and stuff oh, like yeah. that. So I like didn't catch many music videos. So my attachment to music isn't with that. But when I talk with other people I work with, it is exactly that. And music videos are so important because of this other layer to it that you invest in and understand the artist. And I wonder, like, I maybe would have had a different life if I had attached to music videos early. I, I don't yeah. know. But. There's, it's, it's interesting, like, you'd think that album art wouldn't have that much of an impact. Right. And it probably doesn't. Like, let's be honest. It probably I don't doesn't. know, but like certain albums are burned into my mind. Yeah. Like there's a, there's an album of Vampire Weekend. Yeah. I think it was like their second album, which is like this girl in a yellow polo top. Mm -hmm. I forgot the name of the album name. But I just remember as like this high school kid staring at it and it's ingrained into my mind specifically because like the aesthetic, like the sepia is it sepia yeah yeah, yeah. Sepia, like, like, that, like image super brown warm. image tone yeah, yeah. and then as well as like i couldn't quite put a finger on if she was attractive or not yeah and so i was like, <laughs> like yeah I know that's a stupid thing almost misogynistic thing but i was like and i i still like remember that cover art to this day just because of that and i like stared at it and i was like i really can't tell <laughs> wow and like that and i love vampire weekend yeah and, and that's so i don't know there's probably something there that it has someone's done a lot of research, but I haven't. Dude, or like Blink 182, Enema of the State, yeah. like the nurse cover, like that is so oh, iconic course, yeah. that like that's Super. been a Halloween costume ever since. Like there, um, there is something there. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Def especially, I wonder now though, especially because it's more like singles and streaming. I think versus about that. like, yeah, because in Japan, for example, as well as like when we were growing up. It was still CDs. And Japan yeah. still is CDs. Like Tower <laughs> Records still yeah, exists. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, CDs yeah. is the main way people purchase music. And so, yeah, I assume it matters more there. Yeah, you're probably right. I think about that with singles. I'm like, because now you can kind of like take an iPhone photo and be like, yeah, it seems cool. And like that's the single <laughs> art or whatever. Or do the Rust thing where it's just like kind of like icons yeah. on like colors. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Which I think like, 
I, I don't know. I think now I like that it's less precious and I like that artists can just like put something out and it's cool, whatever. But I still respect the like very well thought out album art. I think there there will always be something very rad to that. I, I think it's like a great in between now because you don't have to think about it too much. But the ones that do, it means more. Yes, you know? exactly. So I think that. it's like a best of both worlds. Yeah. Right. I got so deep into conversation that a, a typical starting point and we're not at starting now. We're like in it. But as far as a listener who doesn't know who you are and what you do and understanding your whole journey, like, wow, that's crazy moving around. And I have questions. But before I get into those, I think to also set the stage a little bit more, the brief explanation of now what you're up to and what you're doing and who you are as as the DK that I'm sitting down talking to, because then that'll kind of lead into this story more. Yeah, yeah. So I identify as a studio owner and (laughs) mostly, uh, I think first and foremost, I'm a family man. Like I've got two kids. I got an almost four year old and a year and a half year old. And I've been married with my wife. I got married when I was, was I 21? I think I was 21 when I got married. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. And we have two kids and like, I love being a dad. Like I've always wanted to be a dad. So I think that's the first and foremost thing. Um, And then after that, I'm an entrepreneur and then I'm a mixer. Wow. So, and then after that, I'm a studio owner. Wow. So outside of LA, uh, the reason why it's in that order is outside of LA, usually the head engineer is the owner of the studio, Mm. like in smaller scale, like uh, productions or companies. But out in LA, every single studio owner is almost separate. It's usually not even an engineer of any kind, which is interesting. And they're more like management. Like it's almost like more just like an investment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's kind of like owning the 7-Eleven without actually working in it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it is more scalable in that sense. Like being an engineer, it always makes me laugh because I found myself to become the most passionate about the least scalable thing I've ever done. Uh Like mixing where I can only work with one client at a time, one song at a time. And if I'm not working, it's not getting done. Like the least scalable thing I've ever done. Like time for money forever. Oh, yeah. But it's like, I'm I'm fucking good at it, yeah. <laughs> and or at least I feel like I'm and fucking like good it. at it, and yeah, and I like it. Yeah, I, I love being you know uh, the the healer character, the background character. Everybody needs me, but like I'm not the main character. I'm not the main guy. Well, okay, but this is very interesting because in some of my homework in in listening to you and your evolution, you talk about that where you're like years ago you never would have wanted to be the face of anything, and then you had a bit of a turning point where you were like no, no, no. Like I can do that. And now I think you're very good at it. And you're, yes, you're good at being behind the scenes, but then you're also very good at being DK and being more than just a mixer. Yeah. This is something I'm fascinated by that. This is interesting. I've had other people tell me that too, like other engineers specific, other behind the scenes people Mm. that have vocalized Mm. that they're intrigued by the fact that I'm creating a face, like a brand. Yeah. And even to the point where it's like every other engineer and mixer is like posting on Instagram like the records that they're producing or, or like they're mixing. Yeah. And I'm sitting here like I don't think I've posted a single thing about the records I'm producing or mixing. Yeah. It's just like my family and like yeah. my shit you and my doing podcast. You, yeah, clips of what you're talking about. I don't know why, but as far as like, I mean, it was practical as far as the reason why I started like making content. Yeah. It was like for the brand, right? The reputation, the brand, like kind of like Gary Vee. Type mm. again, entrepreneur first, yeah, right? Yeah. But yeah, I so it's this weird, I have a very weird niche and like mindset. I do not think like other mixers. One, musically, I'm I'm a musician. Like I come from a songwriting background. Like I, I was a professional singer for years. Oh. Yeah. But, well, I mean, the craziest like as soon as you said that, in my head, I was like, well, fuck, we were only at Chicago. <laughs> so like <laughs> Now we know what you're up to, but maybe it does do it justice to go a little bit back and tell a little bit more of this evolution of the story that gets us to the point. Yeah. So you're in Chicago, you're growing up in Chicago, you're learning all of this music. You've kind of shared like those early foundational artists, which I love, but then you end up in Utah and now you're here in LA. So what was that like? At what points of your life are you discovering things? Like when do you start singing? When do you start learning how to mix? What is that? It was while I was doing my church service thing in Japan. Mm. I was sitting on the toilet. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I'm doing church service stuff. So I I was praying a lot, you know, and trying to, I'm a 20 year old, 19, 20 year old punk. Yeah. (laughs) praying, Praying to, you know, my idea of God. Yeah. And 
basically asking them <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> he or her that like what am i supposed to do with my life whoa like what am i what do i want to do and i actually wanted to be a psychologist a therapist oh uh probably came from like i have an awesome mother yeah. and an awesome father like as people like yeah. my dad is really really successful but as a father just a total douchebag total mm. dick and was a horrible father yeah and Fuck. <laughs> and because of that, there's probably a lot of like complexes that were developed, which is part of the reason why I had a hard time sharing my face. One oh, of the, wow. the specific thing I I, I don't want to. I don't so need to. Aware of that, right? Yeah, I don't want it to get as deep as it is. But like when I was in high school, I was a very confident person. Like I've all I was the like I was very athletic. I had yeah. a varsity jacket and with all the sports I did like all the sports in high school. I was also musical. Like just genuinely like a relatively talented person, yes. and which developed into a very confident thing. Not arrogant, but just confident. Yes, and. I think that like bugged my family who like my siblings were not as confident. Um, they were probably much smarter than me. <laughs> I consider, like, but they saw that. And then with my mom who probably has her own, definitely has her own complexes. And with my dad who, who I, I think I, I cannot diagnose him. I, I'm not authorized to do that, but I, I see some narcissistic patterns in his life. Wasn't like, saw that I was starting to become the main character in my own life or at least, Whoa. you know what I'm saying? Holy like, fuck, and yeah. And then they, so they, for my entire high school career, they called me a narcissist nonstop. And I wasn't, I know for a fact, like yeah, it took yeah, me a yeah, lot yeah, of therapy yeah. to get to it, but like yeah. I know for a fact that I was a narcissist. It got wow, to the point where like, like I couldn't look at my own reflection in the mirror. Holy or like, fuck, bro. So like you did the hard part of going through the teenage years and figuring yourself out and building that confidence in school all to have that, knocked the fuck down exactly and i think i did a decent job at maintaining like that was always in me sure but you could keep the facade yeah and i, I do think that like and this is where it's like the has right i'm not going to get into the has but i do think that it affected me negatively and had an impact on my life mm. but the way that i've had to cope with it and the way that i've learned to overcome it has also helped me in ways that i i and like added character and values in my life that i wouldn't have had if i didn't go through that so it's like i'm yeah, really grateful yeah. for it. but anyway um back to uh the, it's, the music thing but yeah no i just it's crazy because uh what an insane self-awareness and again such different lives and everything but i i know the feeling the, the simple relatable feeling that i have is to get really good at something and to have that confidence and then in like the mid-20s question everything you're doing and like mm. i when i was in that young age i thought the hard part was like 18 through 21 or maybe a little earlier but if you could figure yourself out then it was only getting better you were only more and more certain and life was going to be linear and you're going to have one path and yeah. you keep getting better and better and then when i changed my paths like when i got off of the road for touring and i started to like kind of have to redefine myself i was like i am nothing and it was like <laughs> a weird fucking humbling oh, thing so yeah. uh, very different but I am still drawing parallels where I'm like, holy fuck, like I feel you, dude. There's a there's a story I haven't told on any other like interviews or anything like that, but um, I bring it up every once in a while. The main thing that brought me out of my shell was when I was a senior or sophomore or junior in high school, my neighbor two doors down who was a year or two younger. So he was either in eighth grade when we first met or he was like a freshman and he was like longboarding. Uh-huh. down the street and it wasn't like people cruising like he was like doing tricks and like sliding and like oh, had the gloves right. and everything oh wow and i was like what the heck is this my dad is a skater so like he grew up skating in like the 90s you know 80s and 90s anyway so and we've always had skateboards around the house and we'd go to the skate park every once in a while as family activity where i watched my dad drop in on these like 12 foot half pipes and oh my like, god <laughs> yeah. your dad was like legit my dad good. was young too so like my dad had me when he was 22 so i've always had a young father and yeah. i'm the oldest anyway so i asked him about it and was the and this immediately became for the first time in my life something that I had extreme passion for. So I know that most people, many people, almost everybody, if I'm not mistaken, kind of goes through this phase of I don't know what I like. I don't know Finding if there's purpose. something that I'm willing yeah. to like die for, yeah. like really to go all the way for. This is the first time I was like 16, 17 that I discovered something that I'm like fucking passionate about. Yeah. Like wow. I eat and sleep. Like I literally, there's a few times where like I dreamed about how to do a trick and like I felt the gravity and the physics of the skateboard moving and then the next day I landed on the first try. Dude. Like I like, it was an obsession. Yes. And it got to the point where like even the calorie intake, I started counting because I 
because I wanted to skate because I noticed if I didn't eat enough, I could body. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The hours that I slept. So I knew that if I slept less than five hours or less, it would dramatically impact my balance. So I couldn't practice. And so things like things like that. So like I started doing way better in school. I started like like becoming way more confident again. And it was the first time ever. It got to the point where my senior year of high school, my entire senior year of high school and summer vacation afterwards, I was actually paid to skate. I no was a professional way. downhill longboarder no for a year. Way. Yeah. And then I dropped it because I went and did my two-year mission thing. So crazy. No, I am like, so fucking in on your story, bro. Like, <laughs> I feel like I'm watching a movie. Like, yeah. So it was, that was like the first time I've ever done. It was my first paid thing. So I like went to competitions and I'd win them. Yeah. And like, I would get sometimes paid from sponsors, but most of my income was from, I'd take my winnings yeah. that was sometimes money, but mostly like equipment. Yeah. And I'd sell them because yeah. I'd get all my equipment for free from my sponsors. But the point is like the first time that I ever recognized, like I'm willing to do this for free for the rest of my life. I'm willing to- You found to, your thing. Yeah, That's purpose. Like, like, and, yeah, exactly. And I was really sad when I stopped doing it. Um, so the reason why this is important is because, so back on the toilet, you know, in 2019, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was praying to God. I was like, yo, what is, what am I supposed to do? I want to be a, a therapist, psychiatrist, some sort of thing like that. I, the human mind just intrigues me. Mm. There was a moment where I wanted to be a therapist. And in my mind, in that moment, I felt like I had a big epiphany, like revelation, you could say, that, okay, would I do this for free? Like, would I be a yeah. human garbage can for free? Right. Yeah. And the That's answer was no. Like, I don't think I would. Genuinely. Yeah. Like, I love people and I want them to be better. Like I would be doing it to help people, but I wouldn't do it for free. Wow. So at the end of the day, wouldn't I be doing that for money? And this is, okay, so this is the crazy thing. The normal mind would yeah. think in order to provide for my family, I should do things that make money, even if it's something that I hate. And that's like yes. the manly masculine thing to do, right? Yeah, like that's like very like just societal, like that's yeah. what you do. You and bro, know? I'm an Asian immigrant. Like I'm supposed <laughs> to like, I don't care. It doesn't matter if you don't want to be a doctor. You're supposed to yeah, be a doctor. Like you know <laughs> societal <laughs> norms and expectations. So yeah, this right. is whatever this outlier going on here yeah. is, who knows? But so, so I and had this moment and then, it, so in my backwards mind at the time and this mindset, I was like, but I'd be willing to do music. A little bit back up. I joined a band in high school randomly. Yeah. My friend asked me to. I did it. What did it you was play? fun. And I started like recording. I played bass. Okay, cool. And I started recording and singing and stuff. That was like foundational for like yeah, the yeah. creation process. Also to like skateboarding bands. Yeah, like I get it. I yeah, feel yeah. it. Like it's yeah, high school yeah, life. Yeah, that's like, like yeah. <laughs> and uh, music was the thing. And it was in that moment that I, I've never looked back from that moment. Like that was a strong, that left a strong enough impression on me that like I went to college and I got married knowing that this is what I was going to do. I didn't know if I was going to be like on stage as a singer. I didn't know if I was going to be a producer. I didn't know if I, whatever it was or a tour manager but or it was anything. music. I was going to do music. Dude. And there was no plan B. I love that. Uh, you uh, like you said it as such a simple thing, but I think like if anybody is thinking about that or struggling with purpose, like what a great way to frame it. Of like, would I do this for free forever? Like, does that not just say <laughs> it? Like, have you ever thought about that? Like, well, what a great I, yeah, I life purpose check. Like, but like how profound that actually is of just that question. Cause like for me, like I would record podcasts for the rest of my life forever if it never paid a penny. Like I fucking love talking to people. I love hearing stories. Yeah, this is interesting. I wonder, and I probably do have some sort of complex with money. Mm. I try not to because I'm not, I'm not trying to like curse myself to never make money. Like if I hate, if I think money is evil, that means I'm damning myself to never have money. You know yeah, like it's okay to be yeah, successful. Yeah, exactly. But like, like yeah. my dad was super classic American dream, climbed the corporate ladder like crazy. Oh, so like, he went from like pro skater to like fucking. Well, he he wasn't a pro skater. He like oh, okay. he was just like oh, for got fun it. Oh, with okay. his friends. Oh, okay, got it. But like he did graduate college. Like now has a PhD. He got it when he was like before it was like 45 i wow, think in like wow. management or something like that and and like he's one of the like the top dogs at ibm right now yeah, wow. like crazy oh. like really high level did dude that started thing. at like the poorest of like, the poor fucking did like the grandparents thing. were poor yeah and yeah. like he oh he's like really good at making money the corporate way not as yeah. an entrepreneur yeah yeah and uh so i've had this weird thing and i as you know my complexes with my dad specifically like i've never thought that like he'd always try to pay for our happiness. Like, oh, like, oh, we don't spend enough time together as a family. So instead of sacrificing time at work 
and doing things at home, like eating dinner together and playing games with us or various things, playing basketball with me, right? He would then instead pay to force everybody to go to Disneyland for a few days, uh, which was like, it's a good idea if everybody <laughs> wants to go. Yeah. But when you don't have a good relationship already and the, and the genuine reason why you pay for it is to force everyone to be together. So it's not like, Hey, we let's, let's enjoy it. Let's it's like, it's like, no, it's because we're not going to do this if we don't, we're not going to hang out with each other unless we do it. Wow. So like he yeah, created yeah. this, like, so that's why for me, I have like hardcore boundaries with my work. Yeah. And like, Whoa. I do not work past like five or 6 PM. Holy I try not shit. to. And like, I take weekends off yeah. for sure. And yeah. I spend as much time with my kids as possible because, and and going back to the money thing, like yeah. I have, I think I have a weird complex. And and for me, my understanding, my priorities are, and always has been, I will make money if I pursue what I like. Yes. I because agree I'll be that. good at doing yeah. what I like. Yeah, right? I very and, much agree. And instead of pursuing money. Yeah. And and this is super interesting. I and and people are gonna hate me and think I'm I'm very wrong for this, but my dad and many, many other people, and they're right for this. They always talk about money is not something that you seek, but you you want a stable amount of income. Mm, mm. Like you want to make enough money where you don't have to think about money. Well, I mean, I think anybody is like, yeah, you want to survive. Money helps you survive. Like and that's yeah, a very like, yes, I and feel And a you. classic yes. like wealth motivation thing yeah. is like money won't make you happy but it'll take away the things that make you unhappy it's you know, very hard to argue these principles like it's pretty like yeah like it helps yeah, yeah. I, I think so but for me personally yeah my my wife also comes from like her dad was chinese living mm. in japan married to a japanese woman mm. so he was never that wealthy either so like and her father passed away when she was older so like her family has always been like financially struggling so like very humble yeah. compared to my entitled upbringing interesting and the difference between her family and my family and this is just the way that my mind i'm sure that it's more than this but the way that my mind puts it into boxes is that oh money is a direct correlation with family happiness and so she grew up like really humble and like they stick together like you they can be in a pandemic for a year and never yeah. leave the house and they would love each other more They're someone's dying in my family day three <laughs> like knives are being pulled out people are dying <laughs> Someone's wow. going to die. Uh, so like I've always, I, that's part of the reason why I married her is because I wanted that family dynamic. Yeah. Where we can be in the living room talking to each other and nobody wants to kill anyone. Interesting. <laughs> I, I, I've struggled with, um, I grew up like uh, different in this side, but like very loving parents. I'm like, I, 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 I fucking, we didn't have a ton. We were never poor, but it was like lower to middle, middle class. And it was always, you can do anything you set your mind to. Like so supportive, so loving, but there was never resource to back it. So it was like, oh, cool. You want to get into cars? Like find a job if you want to buy a car because we're not going to buy it for you. So like it was always like you can go do anything. Like we're not going to tell you you have to do this career or anything like that, but whatever you want to do, like figure out how you're going to do it. Mm. So I've always like viewed family uh, very supportive. So I wouldn't say that I like I, I don't have that in common there. But when I think about money, something that I've struggled with is because I started at relatively zero, it's something that I try not to obsess over. And the more and more like you almost can feel a guilt of becoming successful. Mm. It's like that's something that I find very mm. interesting with money is like when you know a certain way, like for so like for your wife's family, right? If you were to give them a ton of money, oh, yeah. would they feel a guilt? Because they've now they've fi mm. they've found happiness without it so then you're like all right cool facilitate anything else i think there's a saying that says the fastest way to ruin a man's life is give him a million dollars they don't deserve whoa whoa right like fucking crazy yeah i think but, that there's a lot of truth in that yeah uh, if you gave my wife's family a million dollars like first off yeah they would feel guilty having right, it be like right. oh what am i supposed to do with this yeah they'd probably do really well with spending it. <laughs> like, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, like they probably wouldn't blow it knowing how well they do. But yeah, that's but, interesting. But I, 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 that's the thing that I think about and, and like my personal journey of growing is like my relationship with it is like reminding yourself like, how, like always keep your values, but it, it's also okay to be successful. Like as you continue to get good at something and do the thing you love, it's okay for that thing to give you money and let you oh, survive. Yeah. But that's like a wild one. So, so- yeah, and it's interesting for me, the way that I look at money and, and going back to all those like tips and advice that my yeah. dad and many other people make, um, I've never been wealthy as far as like liquid assets month uh -huh. to month. Uh -huh. I've never been wealthy. I'm very wealthy in assets, like non-liquid assets. Like mm. I own a part of a company that is very profitable. highly valued, yeah, yeah, evaluated yeah, yeah. and profitable. Yeah. 
But as far as like how much I bring home and pay rent with, mm. I'm probably more poor than most people. But the difference is, is that I've created a bunch of assets. Right. So like I could dip into it and yeah. whenever I want, yeah. I could sell things or sell stock or whatever. Yeah. I'm never going to. Right. And, and, <laughs> and so it's like, or like my company, I could just like shut it down. Although yeah. I don't know why I would. You cash out. Yeah. So I do more things than people think. Like I do a lot more things for free or a very minimal, less than minimum wage. As far as like how it turns out from hours to dollars. Yeah. I do them more because I'm passionate about passion. it. Passion. And it's, it's interesting. I, I assume, and I'm in this mentality right now. And granted, when I moved to LA and especially like this last year, I'm making the most money I've ever made. Sick. Um, so like I'm, I'm in a much better spot now. Yeah. yeah. But it's because I've like earned it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like it's, yeah. And, and it makes, one of the things that I think about, I think about all the time, like I think that situation is great with your parents. Yeah. Where like they wouldn't back you. Right. Which is great because now you're, it's it. going to take a little bit longer to get better at it, to learn it. Yep. And I, I think that you can't get full joy. I really believe this is you can't get full joy or happiness out of something unless you fucking struggle. Yeah, and, and you so like, like you know what it's like to earn something. Yeah, there's yeah. been there's like the only times I've ever had like sincere forms of like imposter syndrome in any sense is when I because I was talented, I got too good at things too fast. Whoa. So that's the only time I've ever been like, okay, hold on. Like so mixing was like that at the beginning cuz granted and too fast as in like in long-term scale. So like I put in 100 hours of week at the studio. Yeah. And so, of course, I'm going to get better faster. Very right. like ADHD. Statistically, like just like hours in. Yeah. Like if you're clicking the buttons and moving the knobs that much, you're going to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, but I mean, after five years, yeah. I've been doing it for five years. Granted, 80 to 100 hours a week for five years. This is before we had kids, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm going to be better than anybody else that's been doing it for five years. And... It's this weird level of like pride where it's like, oh, I deserve the recognition, yeah. but I still haven't gotten it because I'm still young yeah. and I'm better than everybody else. And I recognize it because I'm good enough to recognize it. But at the same time, I don't deserve it because this is like, what am I supposed to say that I'm special? Right. And the ego doesn't allow me to do that. My ego doesn't allow me to think that I'm special or I'm better than anybody else. My ego just beats the shit out of me all the time. Like, you're not good enough, huh? So, like, Dude. It's, it, it's interesting to me that, and, and that, like, it's okay for people to take a long time to get good at something or feel like they get good at something because I feel like that's when it pays off the most emotionally. Like, that's when you're allowed to celebrate that victory. And that's, like, where you can, like, stop and smell the roses kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I don't mean to get into theology. I'm, I'm huge well, into theology. Like, I mean, I, I will say in this, like, I, want, I, I wanted three things to accomplish in this episode. So I wanted to hear about your story and it, how you got to where you're at and I feel like we we, we did that yeah. <laughs> and then I wanted to hear about like some of the things that you've created business wise and hear about some specifics but then also there was a specific episode that you put out on your mixing music podcast which could have been a whole different type of podcast but you were talking about I, I forget the title but it was like it's okay to think you're great or something like that oh. and you talked about the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, like what you're talking about right here, I'm so into. So like, please, like I'm, <laughs> I'm so here for this tangent because that idea of like dumb people will think they're better at things than they actually are and smart people will will doubt themselves. And I think that like, you know, you talk about listening to podcasts, you talk about the type of person that's educated in a podcast, you talk about us becoming obsessed with these things, like the intelligence being a curse and thinking about the meaning of it. Like, dude, I am so there with you. So like, I wanted to talk about this and everything you're saying, I'm like, God, I fucking feel you. I always feel bad talking about this sort of stuff. I love this. Like my wife and I will talk about philosophy, ethics, yeah. theology, like all the time. Like this yeah. is like the thing that I love to do and I'm most passionate about. But I will preface every time I do this like publicly, yeah. I will preface that I am not a trained psychologist. I am not any sort of authoritative figure. I'm just a dude that's read a lot of books yeah. and I've talked to a lot of people and I've listened to a lot of podcasts. I've never done that preface. So like, maybe I owe that to. Like, yeah, like, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm dumb, but I'm smart enough to know that I'm dumb. You know, <laughs> And I've taken the time to read about being dumb and I want to be better, but I'm not <laughs> professional enough to tell you how to be better, but I'll tell you my thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot of truth. And the interesting stuff about this is with most things with philosophy, it all comes from a place of like logic. Yeah. So what I'm what when we talk about this, you don't have I don't have to be super trained for you to recognize, oh, I think there's some truth in that. Mm. I mean, even from a theological point, like every religion yeah. believes in some sort of form of revelation or like at least affirmation. 
Yeah, sure. Like, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, if I do something and it makes me feel good, yeah. regardless as if it's actually coming from God enough, like, there's something that happens in the human mind that yeah. recognizes, okay, this is within my core value system. And to my my point to that is, like, ultimately, like, you could question somebody's religion or values, but if that person is becoming a better person or feeling good by doing it, then what else matters? Yeah. Oh, oof. <laughs> I have, I okay, can I ask you a theoretical question that I talked to my wife about the other sure. day? Sure, oh my God. I, this is a tangent. I want to keep brief. I want to keep brief. But, yeah, I'm in. Um, I, I, I need to figure out, I've only said this out loud once, so oh my God. I might not be able to portray what I'm thinking. Uh, I am exactly. so in. Okay, uh, you're a new life, right? You, uh-huh. You're naive about many, many things. Uh-huh. And let's say your brother or a cousin comes up to you. Yeah. And says, yo, yeah. like, do you like drinking coffee? Uh, you're asking this. Yeah, I'm asking. Do you like drinking coffee? I really do. Okay, okay. So let's say you've never, ever, as far as you know, coffee is great. Caffeine just makes you feel great. It's awesome. Yeah. But if a cousin comes up to you and says, hey, ca- there's recent studies have shown caffeine has caused cancer. Yeah. It's really bad for you. You should probably stop. Uh. You didn't know that before. You were very naive about it. Yes. Or maybe something that's not even real. That's probably more likely the scenario. Like, uh, there's some studies that show that caffeine and coffee can cause cancer. Okay, it's not yeah, like a for yeah. sure thing, some, but Yeah, some. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm in. I'm in. I okay, you. now you're not naive, right? You've opened this, this door to awareness that you can't close anymore. Yeah. Okay. Who, who's, is it you that's at fault now for continuing to drink caffeine, knowing that information? Or is it your cousin's fault for making you no longer naive, for taking away that naivety? Who's in the wrong? Fuck. Okay. I would say, and I think about this because I, you know, ignorance is bliss, right? Like I, God, do I think about that. However, I also think that that's an irresponsible way to live life of trying to hide from knowledge Mm. for the sake of ignorance is bliss. That is irresponsible. That, But I mean, like in this scenario, right? And this is where we can say, like, this relates to theology and things that come from God. It's like Mm. the entire point of faith is that we don't know. That's like the entire point. Like the most amount of faith that you could ever possibly have in any religion is, oh, shit, that would be cool if like God existed. Like that's anything that's more than that is not faith. That's that's actually technically, I mean, blasphemy. (laughs) Like Uh (laughs) that's that's evil <laughs> and and i mean and i know that cultures will say yeah. otherwise like christian yeah. culture specifically will say otherwise but no it's it's not anything more so that's why i'm saying like in this sense is it actually ignorance is bliss because we don't even know if that's confirmed right so i'll take it a step further so i for a minute like i i actually thought about that in life and i was like i, I wish i wouldn't learn things because like i i like my my blissful ignorance and i'm like no dude like that's not it and then I started to think about knowledge and how rad it is to like be able to study and to learn things and to hear things. And then I think that it comes back to a personal responsibility. Mm. So the more you learn, the more knowledge is there, it is then your responsibility that gives you more control and education and power. I like, I really do mm, believe knowledge power. is power. Absolutely. So then it is up to you to do with that knowledge what you want. And it is your freedom of choice. So it's like, okay, cool. I fucking love coffee. And I love this analogy. I love coffee. And then this cousin comes By the way, that's not true, by the way. The whole, no, I, I totally no. made. I, oh, totally, sh- totally. But it's perfect because it's so <laughs> relatable. So like that person comes up to me. Did they mean ill will to me by that? Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe they were just saying it. Of right? course, and they that's probably didn't mean it. Right, exactly. They probably genuinely believe exactly. it. Exactly. Like, dude, what if in passing in this podcast, you're like, by the way, did you know that uh, podcasts that you record through Logic statistically do worse? Like, is that you trying to ruin my career, put me into some spiral? Like, no, you're just like a guy that records, like, right? So I never look at it like that, but you then have this information. Well, that's great. You now have more information and it is up to you. You can do anything you want with that knowledge. And I like I have to view that as a positive thing because I then could say I can find knowledge against that. I can find knowledge to add to that. I can find knowledge more and more. And then I get to something that is basically my meaning of life. And Mm. I view life as a rental car. And I think that you can go view, you can go get the rental car. And you can drive the boring Kia and you, it'll smell like 
cigarettes and diapers and whatever else, and you're not going to love it and you're going to drive it for five days and it doesn't matter and you'll return it clean with a full tank of gas and then you're done and you could live life like that. Or you can take that rental car and you can go try to jump off some railroad tracks and do some burnouts and get it all dirty and fucking make the best of that Kia and see how fast it'll go. (laughs) And return it with the full tank. And you know what? It has insurance and it doesn't matter if you dented it up because we're all going to die anyway. And the (laughs) rental car is over. So that's like, I have to, like when I get so, so self-aware, I'm like, at the end of the day, it's all a rental car and it doesn't matter. So it's still my choice. Like the coffee could kill me or not kill me. A lot of things could or couldn't do that. So I'm going to make the best of all of it. And knowledge helps me make the best of all of it. It's interesting because I think that this is these types of questions kind of really help you figure out where you're at. Mm. I really, really liked your answer. Thank you. And I mean, obviously, you I can liked say, your question. Yeah. So obviously, the one way you can take it is, yes, that person who broke my naivety is yes. at fault because yeah. it's, it may not be true. It might be false information. Correct. And that could be some sort of narrative or some sort of lead into their insight into their mind and yeah, their their complex totally or they could say no the person like no it's it's your responsibility to know it's it's not their fault at all yeah. which could insight and obviously your answer you can also even say like very many other things like what is coffee you know sure yeah well isn't it better to die happy than to right. like love in coffee even if it's bad for, it, there's so many different answers uh but i think with this is that First off, we should be thinking about this. And I think that you're exactly right. Like knowledge is power. Yeah. Um, and the only reason why anybody makes money from anything is two things. They're either willing to eat more shit than somebody else or wow. they know something more than somebody else. That's the only two things. Like think about why would anybody get promoted as a manager? It's because they can eat more shit. They can not eat more shit. That's the wrong. They can take more shit. Yeah. Well, but like I feel what you're saying. I completely get you. Yeah. <laughs> I got confused. There's a there's a book uh, by an author named Ben Horowitz called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It's about being it's a, a great CEO. book. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and one of my favorite quotes, and we use this at Launchpad, is when you got to eat shit, don't nibble. And that's yeah. That's probably, <laughs> yeah. That's probably where I got confused. But uh, um, anyway, uh, so it's it's our responsibility, and also to learn. Like, why do I? get hired for what I do yeah. or have anybody listens to me or become any sort of thought. It's because I know something more. Wow. I have this knowledge. And that's wow. why I like to share it is, is also like this go-giver mentality. Like you're influential when you're able to give someone what they want. Wow. And so if you share that knowledge, I mean, there we can go into like that sort of thing. But um, the reason why I bring this thing, this idea and, and psychology up is one, shrooms are awesome. And I took shrooms like, uh, for the first time a, year, a couple years ago. And wow. that- that really broke me out of like all of my therapy that I took and everything just in a single moment, just like, like made sense. Everything Crazy. just made sense in a single moment. I took notes while I was on shrimp. I can't read the shit, you know, it looks like alien, you know? like, <laughs> but like it was, it was a very like, can I say obscenely beneficial, like obscenely beneficial for me. Wow. And wow. like, that's where I started taking my brand a lot further. There's been many moments in my life where like, okay, I'm allowed to be confident. Yeah. Okay. And I'm allowed to like myself. So yeah, I kind of yeah. Dunning-Kruger thing. Anyway, um, the reason why like we talked about the Dunning-Kruger effect and intelligence and knowledge and things of that nature with my wife is because our second born son yeah. was born a month premature, wow. was in the NICU for eight months because, because he had, uh, he, his lungs, weren't, lungs and heart wasn't working because he has Down syndrome. And so he is literally like retarded. <laughs> and oh and don't worry don't be sad like i'm gonna I'm, just, pre- like, I'm gonna preface all this with i hope everybody who ever wants children has the blessing of having a down syndrome child i feel bad for people who do not have down syndrome children it is the best thing ever dude i'm like so like just it locked is, like it, I, i'm it is just the best thing ever. i'm in learn mode right now oh, i'm like, like tell me every okay. thought it, you have anyway right so we the point of that is like we were talking, my wife and I, we were talking about like, okay, intelligence and like, blah, 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 blah. And like, if, for example, um, the DNA DNA editor CRISPR or something like developed to a point where we can cure him and oh make him God. normal again, I see what would we at. ethically choose to make sure that he has regular intelligence or like at least average intelligence? And my wife immediately, she's like, have you ever read the book Flowers for Algernon? I fucking knew you were going to say it. Oh mm. my God. Yeah. And that book is, it's a science fiction book, yeah. but it's a really sad book about basically this uh, retarded guy that yeah. uh, uh, mentally re- has mental retardation. It 
gets surgery in his brain and becomes one of the smartest people in the world yeah. ever to have existed and then also degrades back to his original mentally retarded state and it is so intriguing and like basically the point of that book is intelligence is absolutely he, o- oppositely correlated to happiness he was happier it, like all of it was for nothing and he was happier ignorance is bliss i know I, I know. But at the same time, there's the there's the complex like the yin and yang where it's like also to purposefully stay ignorant is not ethical, right? Correct. Correct. So it's like, yeah, and so, it's like so it's in like, that in that crazy life because he has such loving parents who have this awareness, he is going to live an incredible life. Oh, because he doesn't get to choose to the level that he can learn. It's it's there. It's oh, dude. set. And I get, to, dude, I'm really, really, this is so bad. <laughs> this is so bad. I'm going to say this publicly on your podcast. There's like a part of me that like, cause you don't really know how bad Down syndrome is, like how bad, like they're, it hurts their development. I genuinely until they like, develop. I don't know. Like some yeah. Down syndrome kids like actually end up becoming developed enough where they can hold some sort of like lower level, like grocery store kind of job. Okay. And there's some people that like cannot leave home and like, I see. I see. So it's like, yeah. it's varying and you can't really tell until they're developing. Like, wow. But there's a part of me that like is kind of like hoping that he stays a little bit less developed. Wow. So I can at least have one child that never leaves me. <laughs> so oh I can like, God. cause I don't want empty nester sounds horrible. <laughs> like, just retirement like, Yo, from this parenting. is my guy. Like, let's just like, hang out. Oh We're my good. gosh. And like, it, like with most kids, like if you coddle them too much, it's like bad for them. Yeah. But with then, like him. for him, it's like it never ever hurts him. Like I can just like cuddle with him all day, every day, and at no point is it ever going to be bad for him. Like that's, that's I need that, dude. Need that's that like you just fucked me up so hard with that. And like I don't know, there's so much in what you just said too of like genuine love. I think for people oh, yeah. and like that like view. Like I think that's such a beautiful view because I think like you took something that people could interpret as as a negative thing to happen to a family, right? Like, I don't fucking know. But, like, I'm sure there's a lot of emotions if you have a child that is retarded. Like, Yeah, there's... But... It's... Sorry, I'm, last thing about this. Dude. Again, like, I wanted to have kids when I was young, right? Yeah. Have you watched Maniac on uh, Netflix? Like, no, the 10 no, episode long? First off, it's really cool. It's, like, the aesthetic of it. Like, from a creative standpoint... It's as if like, because 80s Japan was in an economic bubble uh-huh. and I listened to a lot of like 80s Japanese music. Anyway, uh-huh. we're not going to get into that. I love city <laughs> pop. Like that's Dude. what I grew up with. Uh, but during the bubble, like Japan had a lot of influence in America. Americans thought like Japan was like sophisticated and cool. Yeah. So it's the aesthetic of the show is if Japan had continued to innovate and create more technologies in like New York. So it's like, it's very Japanese. And like, oh anyway, my so God. that's the aesthetic. Oh, it's really I need cool to watch. Are you kidding me? The aesthetic it's, alone is worth watching. But anyway, that's incredible. at the very That's end, all the stuff I like. Yeah. And at, I think it was like episode eight. I, I remember because we watched this recently with my wife. Um, there's a point where the dude says, for a family that's supposed to have unconditional love, there seems to be a lot of conditions. Like, and that like, I was like, oh shit. Fuck. And and like I haven't been able to w- been able to word it as eloquently as that before. Yeah. But I feel like that kind of explains my life because like my father, it, it it's it's gotten so bad and it's gotten worse as and I don't mean to shit talk my father publicly. I apologize, yeah. but uh, it's not good of me to do this. But um, it's gotten to the point where he's done some things where he'll like he pays he at for a long time we were very mon- financially dependent on him. Oh, wow. And he would do things like if we stayed with him, huh. he would like not let you pay rent so he can continue to have financial oh, like dependence on him. Oh, wow. But so it's like very manipulative with money. Again, go like he'll like pay for Disneyland even though nobody would want to go. Oh, my God. And then he'll make you great. He'll force you to be grateful for it. And, it's like, and then he'll like bring it up in later arguments. Like you want to go to Disney. Like that kind of like monetarily. And every single time, like he was a business dude. So he'd like make us sign contracts as kid. I'll buy you the skateboard. But you have to do this oh and this and this. And like, I actually thought that was actually really, really yeah, good. Yeah, like it's so crazy because like I could even, I don't know this dude, but like I can understand if that to him is like the thing that he thinks is valuable to instill those values in his children is love. Yeah, and, right? and that's the thing. So I, I think my problem with my own father Wow, this is getting really deep on this podcast. <laughs> just, just this is just sentence alone to take, I think no, my problem with my yeah, own father is, is it's not that he didn't love me enough. In, in fact, I've it's the opposite. I mm. think that I was his oldest son, and now I understand the the emotional deep connection that mm. you, as a father, you have with your oldest son, specifically mm. son. 
And, and I'm the firstborn child to begin with. Like your first entry into your world as a parent. Yeah. You, you cannot describe. There's no amount of training that you can ever be prepared for. I've, ho- I've just heard yeah. that. And I like, won't that's, understand that's, it that's until the, I have a kid. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, and it's, there's a special bond there. Yeah. And I was exceptional in yeah. many different ways. Yeah. And I think it was because he loved me so much yeah. that, have you ever heard the phrase... Um, Someone said this um, at my church like a couple years ago. Uh, The opposite of faith is not fear. The opposite of faith is control. Have you heard this? No. I mean, think about this. Like if you were fearful, if you were driven by fear. Yeah. If my dad was so afraid of what I would become and like he was obsessed with my flaws and weaknesses to the point where like the first time I ever introduced my wife to him, uh, he just basically talked shit about me for 15, 20 minutes straight to the point where like my wife was in tears. My, my then fiance was in tears. Uh. Like she's like, oh, like, and she's like, she kind of understood as, first off, you don't want me to marry him because this is my prized son and you're making me feel like I'm not good enough. And on top of that, like, so it's like this weird thing. Anyway, so I think the problem is he loves me too much. Wow, wow. That was a super crazy tangent. Let's yeah. go back into like music. Well, I <laughs> know, <laughs> I know my real back in already so oh, if, really? if you want the real back in please but please please the, my, i i just the my last piece to say on that is i love the podcast because it's so fucking cool to be able to learn people and have conversations like this and like when when we talk about like philosophy and all of these like deeper existential things and all that like i my whole thing with this is I just want it to be relatable and I want to share all of the stories with so many people. So anyone listening, like anyone that relates to any bit of it can then take that and learn and use something. So like any amount of discussion and topics we talk about, I think is helpful and useful. And if it's not, then fucking tune out, whatever. (laughs) So I don't know. I just like, I'm never like upset about like a sidebar. Like I just think it's fucking great. I love it. Yeah. Um, But the, we've talked about all of the things that I wanted to talk to you about except one. And that is on the more business side, something that I'm very interested, like a genuine question I have for you is like, I think that a lot of creatives can get stuck because maybe they don't realize their skills are valuable because it feels like that thing you would do for free forever. And you have a passion, you have a thing, but maybe you don't necessarily know how to turn it into a business. And I have learned so fucking much about you and it's so insane. But something that I observe from the outside is you actually do have a very good mind for taking those things that you love and turning them into an actual business or finding a way to monetize that. And I wanted to ask you about that because I think that that's something that any creative, regardless of music or any field, could benefit from your mindset of how you take that. So to then turn that into a question is, how did you take getting good at mixing and then turning that into businesses and compounding that onto then how to make other businesses and make money out of that? Yeah, this is great. Um, so I think my superpower when it comes to this sort of stuff yeah. comes from a genuine character flaw. Mm. Uh, with the super like off the charts poster child level of ADHD that I've always had. Yeah. Um, and the coping mechanisms I've had to develop around it. But uh, I've always been that kid yeah. that burns his hand on the stove. You tell oh. me that stove is hot, I won't believe you. I'll burn I'll, oh until I burn God. my hand. Oh my God. So like, I'm really, really, really good at making way more mistakes than everybody else. Holy fuck. I'm like way good at making mistakes. So first off, mixing specifically came in afterwards. So I got into the entrepreneurial world because I started a studio. But this is the first time that I'm actually like engineering for like any sort of substantial money, like paying, trying to pay rent with. Yeah. I was as much of an entrepreneur as I was learning to be an engineer because I didn't have the skill set to be a proper cre- credible engineer. Like I was learning along the way. Necessity for So, yeah. and people saw there's a, like my first few business partners. So by the time I was 26, yeah, I had started five or six businesses and failed four of them no shit yeah and started to the point of like llc like bank yeah, accounts. yeah 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 yeah. of course yeah Fuck. and um had like companies and contracts i've this is an interesting one um i was 24 when i lost and this is not that crazy but it's still crazy i think i was like 24 25 when i lost eight hundred thousand dollars in like 30 seconds no that's crazy and what? luckily it wasn't debt 
It was, we had a contract to make $1.6 million between me and my business partner. Yeah. And they were about to sign the papers. CEO, our CIO of the company that was going to buy us out did not under, like misunderstood one thing that the CIO did not tell him. Like CIO, it's his fault, basically. CEO heard, got like freaked out and decided not to sign the papers. And after that, it kind of just like shriveled away. So oh. it was like that thing that he had a concern about was already cleared. He just forgot to tell him. Oh and like God. that spooked him enough where he didn't want to do it. And so like that, I remember like that's, that's something that's like heavy for that's a 24, 24 year old kid to do. Anyway, so um, yeah, there was. Oh my God. So it's like literally like burning your hand. In. You're just not afraid to fail. Like you've oh, done the reps not. of failing. And, and again, like I think it's like partially a character flaw. Cause like that's, there's a part of that for me, like I've considered a superpower and it makes me who I am and I it's made it. me like better. Right. But at the same time, like, it's also the reason why, like, I'm an arrogant shit, you know? <laughs> Holy fuck. Like, I'll be like, no, I don't I believe you. Let, let me try it first. Oh, yeah, right. that was actually really hard. Yeah. Like, I will find myself being affected by cognitive bias and the Dunning and Kruger effect and be like, oh, yeah, I did tennis in high school. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, I did, I did varsity tennis in high school. I'm going to be good. And then I play, it's like, you just killed me. It's like, yeah, I'm not that good, actually. <laughs> Dude, I do it with bowling every time. I'm like, I used to be good back in the day. Let me, let me, let me do this. And I'm bad. So it's like, and I think that that's beautiful at the same time, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's but so anyway, fun. so I think that's like the first thing and and because of that i think on the podcast episode that you listen to on six figure home studio i yeah. talked a little bit about this i've talked about this on my own podcast with mixing music i think i have this really unique gift to not be afraid to make mistakes Dude. i'm afraid of many many things yeah the dark being one of the things <laughs> but uh You're like miss me with heights miss me with the dark miss me with deep water but making mistakes and failing yeah it's just <laughs> And for me, it's like, I've always had a good experience like fucking up. Yeah. Like, wow. I know it's really weird to say. It's like, I've never, like, for me, there's one thing that that is an outlier in what I'm about to say for me specifically, but making mistakes usually typically doesn't make me less confident. It actually typically makes me more confident. And I, and I hope that that's what it should do for most people. Like, if you have to go down a path, yeah. right? And you believe in trusting your gut. Do you, yeah. do you have this? Oh my God. I'm you, so you in, in and yes, yes. And your gut tells you, okay, at this Y path, you yeah. go left. You're yeah. supposed to go left. Yeah. Maybe it's even comes from like a theological thing. Like, because oh, I'm God so is in on this, me, like, with, when I'm looking at this Y and my gut is telling me left, do I have any amount of education in this? No, this is just as a totally neutral left or right. Absolutely same. neutral, if you, if you but go, I have to make a decision. Yeah, you have to make a decision. Of course and you I'm go left my gut. Yeah. and you find out it's a dead end and yeah. it was not the right path. Yeah. Most people would be so stuck on that. Be like, I fucked up. I can't trust my gut ever again. Oh, oh wow. my gosh. And they begrudgingly go, go back, yeah. retrace their steps and then go right. Yeah. I'm the dude that gets to that dead end and be like, well, shit, now I know for a fact that right is the perfect way. Like I know, <laughs> like I am now more confident that going right, yeah. like when I yeah. go right, when I trace my steps and go right, it's like, oh, this is it. Yeah. And now I can even go harder. Yeah, I, like, I can put let my, me go right so I can go so far down that right that I find another left and right. And depending until how much road there is till the yeah. next path split, yeah. I can actually even crank the pedal harder. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? I might even get there before the person who picked wow. it the first time. Because I might get so there faster. Because there's certainty that left exactly. isn't it. You're like, well, I'm going fucking right as long as I can now. Let exactly. me tell you about left. Yeah, ex exactly. So like, I've always been that. Um, except one thing, mm. basketball. Like yeah. I've always grown up loving basketball. I play so much. Oh wow! Uh, I'm short. I'm like five seven, five eight. Okay, and it's regular. Uh, and my dad's six one, and my brother's six foot. I don't know how that happened. So by the family, <laughs> you're short. That's yeah, and I have regular. this really, really bad relationship, emotional relationship with basketball. Where like, if I don't play well one day, it genuinely affects my confidence uh, for like the rest uh, of the week. Yeah. Like, so, other than that. Like, other than yeah. <laughs> That's such a funny self-aware thing where you're like, everything else, yes, I hate failing at basketball. Yeah, I just it's just so part of my personality. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I and, love that. Like that that lesson there and like being afraid to fail. Cause like uh, I I don't know. I like I think that that's something that personally, selfishly, I don't fucking know. I think everybody should hear it. It's like 
that should be something we embrace. Like we should accept and and seek failures more and not be afraid of it. But I don't think that is the case. And I think that like typical commonplace is you are afraid of failure and you're afraid of the hypothetical what ifs that then come with failure. And like I, I, I was talking to a friend and he said something to me like, cause I've pivoted in my career so often or I've so many times I've had different lives of that. And he's like, that's so crazy that you're not afraid to pivot and all that. And I'm like, yeah, but it took me longer to get to those pivots than I'd like to admit. And that is because of a fear of failure. So like that, I love that lesson and I, I understand how valuable it is. Did you ever process, like, was there ever a fear of failure? Like, was there ever, was there ever, was it always been like this? As far as I can tell, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I, and also like, again, this is, a, this is coming from a very entitled perspective here, but I've also been pretty good at things. Mm. which again leads to a potential another character flaw where like if I'm not good at something I probably will give up really fast. Interesting. But and I do tend you treat to that really failure differently. Can you can you have the self-awareness and the intelligence to say uh chess like you embrace that failure and you're like sick like I'm going to go get great at checkers or you again, can be like I'm in, I'm inherently not good at chess or checkers so fuck this I'm going to go play basketball. No, but then again if I really got into it, first off, I would usually get into it because there's someone around me that was passionate about it. I read this in a book. I, I doubt that I'm smart enough to have come up with this idea, <clears throat> but I don't remember exactly where it came from. But I think the quote is, the transference of passion, being around passionate people mm. is enlightenment. Fuck. Right? <laughs> and so like oftentimes things, new things start due to some form of enlightenment. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be someone I know. Like oftentimes it is, like the guy with the longboard, right? Yeah. My neighbor. Um, but oftentimes it could just be like, I go on a YouTube binge or like a TikTok thing. Yeah. And I'm watching other people do it. I've always been the type of person where like, I love basketball, but I can't watch the NBA. I can't watch professional sports. Because every time I watch it, yeah. my fun is not in competition. And watching it, my yeah. fun is playing doing the sport. it. Yeah. So like every time I watch basketball, I, I start like you just like want to go play, and I just yeah. don't want to go play. Yeah. It's not saying that like I think I can do it better. It's not coming from a place of pride, but it's right. a place of like I would enjoy it more. You if want I did an it. active role, not a exactly. passive role. So I think the most recent thing that I got into is um, as of like a couple months ago. Yeah. Due to TikTok and Instagram and YouTube binges. Yeah. Is painting. Oh, wow. And I am not an artist at all. <laughs> My wife is a graphic designer. We make kids books and she is the illustrator for that. Yeah. And I'm not. I can't draw a straight line. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I relate. I relate. But I love colors yeah. and textures. And I feel like I'm a little bit more aware of colors than the normal person. Yeah. And that's just always intrigued me. And yeah. so like I make abstract art and that's like, it's fun. And that's one of the first things in my life yeah. where like I genuinely don't give a shit about making money from it. Yeah. That like, I have a business idea. Okay. I, which is a funny one. I'll tell you my business idea for it, but it's like, it's more based off of the idea of it than the actual practicality of the business. Okay. I, I wonder though, instantly in you saying that with somebody who is who is so good at obsessing over a thing and getting good at it and putting the hours in art is such an interesting for thing for you to get into because what's the quantifiable measure of getting oh yeah better? it's interesting right like there in music it's a little bit more objective yes like some songs sound like shit, but then again is it like i love right. outsider music yeah like a uh, hundred gecks like obviously they're is it? clipping all the product like it's everything. not mainstream like, what? It's not. It can't be mainstream. Like 100 gecks will never be mainstream. So there's it's like flirting some, with it. Ah, is, ah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> or like, or like 88 the, Rising. Like, okay, well, hold on. Th that's like good though. I'm talking about like people like the dude that made Rock and Roll McDonald's. Oh, uh, like I said Kenji. I meant Joji. I would think about that for a long time. Yeah, no, like out, like actual genuine like music. That the the appeal of it is that it's ass. You know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah, yeah, that yeah. that will never go mainstream, but. With art, I mean, especially with like postmodernism, it's like perspective. This is so one of my favorite episodes of uh, Stuff You Should Know podcast. Have you listened? Do you listen to that podcast? No, There's a no, podcast called Stuff You Should Know. It's a really, really big one. One of the one of the big ones. There's an episode it. about 
postmodernism and they're trying to describe postmodernism. It's so intriguing. Oh it's such so a anyway. So uh, basically, the idea, and this is both art form, culture, philosophy, just everything. Yeah. The way they in in a, this is so incorrect. But the yeah. way that they try to describe it is that we're all self aware enough, and technology and information is so accessible that we recognize that nothing is anything. Meaning that <laughs> when you look at chocolate and you say that it's brown and it's sweet, do I understand is what I understand it as sweet and brown, the same exact shade as brown yeah, and the same exact meaning of sweetness. Do we even understand the same? Thus, when DuPont makes, wait, like a, a commercially made toilet and puts his name on it and makes that art, then it kind of defines as that art. Oh my God. You know what I'm saying? Pollock with his... <laughs> With this splattering, is that so? It's like this. It's this like you know what I'm saying. So it's like this post. It's really intriguing episode of this podcast, um, and and that's kind of how I'm thinking about it with my art. Is like I genuinely like from the get go. I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at this, yeah. mostly because I liked it, and I think that, that was like the point of it is trying to make art that I like. Mm. Like with music, I try to be like practically em empathetic, empath empathic, and. Em have empathy, practical empathy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm empathetic. We got there. <laughs> no, but uh, ha, like, I, you have to have practical forms of empathy because you're not trying to make music for somebody else, but you right. kind of have to consider what other people like, or else you're just sure. being stupid, right? <laughs> yeah, or it's like purely, like, literally for you, and you're not yeah. ever trying to have it. Yeah, do, like you're very okay with 20, 20 people listening for all and forever. Yeah, and, and you have to have a form of practical empathy because I feel like the point of an artist, wow, we're getting way into this. But anyway, I have a real back too, but, but I'm uh, in on this. But, uh, I know my so real like, back I feel instantly. like the point of an artist is like they're supposed to introduce new perspectives. Like mm -hmm. I love talking about art, especially when in comparison to music because it's it's a different world than what we're used to. So we can kind of see it more objectively. But like when cubism became a thing, mm. people went into like these art exhibits and like had visceral emotional reactions to paint on canvas. Like mm. they were like, I'm upset. Mm. Mm. And they created these false narratives in their mind about like, this person is evil and blasphemous. And mm. like, and like it even went as far, potentially even as far as like their belief in God. It's like, how can you do that? This is a sin against God. Like, which yeah. is always super intriguing to me when like, anyway, we're not gonna get into it. Um, but now with cubism, <laughs> even after all that reaction to it, it's they sell it at Target. <laughs> so like it was this thing that introduced a new perspective, someone that was crazy enough to do something wild that made people upset. Yeah. But now it's become normal. Holy fuck. Right? So it's yeah. like that's what an artist is supposed to do. So they're supposed to make it like weird. Like music is supposed to be weird. like this Drake album that sounds something that most people are not familiar with. Yeah. Like that's the point of an artist is to do something right. that's like not so weird that it's not digestible, but right. make it weird enough that people get upset about it. Yes. Which goes into what I think is one of the purposes of life. Oh my God. Especially after having my own podcast and yeah. recognizing that without having opinions, it is hard to create an audience. Okay. Huh. But with this, okay, with this, if the entire point comes from a quote the quote goes, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but the quote goes along the lines of, the reasonable man will conform himself to society. Uh -huh. The unreasonable man will co try to conform society to themselves. Wow. Thus, all progress is dependent on the unreasonable man. Okay? <sighs> the purpose, the purpose, one of the purposes of our life, and I would go as far as to say the responsibility of our lives is to have opinions and to do things that upset other people. Holy shit. I think that is one of the purposes of this life. Because if you don't have opinions and you are extremely reasonable and you're like, oh yes, but uh, politics, like we can we can disagree on that. But like, I mean, the point is like, like, in, like in other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and like having um, opinions on politics is the low hanging fruit. That's easy that's to e use that. Like, like fruit, opinion yeah. on shit that matters. That's yeah. like, duh, the, yes. And, and you, you even politics too, but like, Granted, yes, there's the learning aspect of it. Like, it, but I mean, like, if you don't, because when we talk, we're thinking out loud. Yeah. Like, I'm developing new ideas that is going to forever change the way I think about things and yeah. talk about things in the future right now, the way Through we're a talking. conversation, yeah. And so if I don't 
talk and try ideas and risk the idea of it sounding stupid. Yeah. Right? I think people continue to say stupid things because they didn't say stupid things when they were younger. Which comes back to your whole thing on failure. Yeah, exactly. Holy fuck. So it's, it's, you have to be, it's scary as fuck. <laughs> but you have to say shit that is going to upset people. It is your responsibility as an artist, as a creative. It is your responsibility as a human and to the benefit of the society, to progress of humankind. You have to fucking piss people off. Dude. Please, for the love of all that is holy, g- try to get sued. Like that, th- like, like that should be your thing, right? Wow. And so... Like, wow. And so with this podcast, yeah, I hope people hate this. I hope people tune out. Yeah. Or else you're doing something wrong. Wow, dude. Like, I, I, I like, holy fuck, I love that. And I, like, I, I, I genuinely, I, I love it. You have me fucked up. I'm <laughs> stuttering because I'm just like, yeah, like, oh my God, yeah. But then also, this comes back to my thing that I was going to tie it back to and conclude of, Having this mindset and embracing failure and and having saying you have to have opinions, you have to want to upset people. You're not going to push society and culture forward. You're not going to advance ideas unless you are unreasonable and you're trying to make the world work around you. So you have embraced that. I see that in you. I feel that in you. I, I It's real. With that and coming back to failures, because I think this is so wonderful, I want to know, you maybe said the worst thing that happened to you with a failure of losing that figurative $800,000. Oh, that was not the worst thing that's ever I want to know. But, but it's a, I want to know to conclude this, your worst and best thing out of failures and what you've learned from both. Out of general failures? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a little subjective, but if you were, because like the reason I'm asking this is people are so afraid to fail. So I want to know what's the worst thing that happened? Like in the worst failure, like here, clearly here you are alive. You're yeah, still fine. Yeah. Have I really failed if I'm alive? Yeah. Uh, Maybe. I, I think yeah. like my worst failure first off is based on my own perception. Whoa. Right? Like, like there's some things that other people, that if other people were in my shoes, would be like, that was it. Like losing, like people that really care about money, losing a potential $800,000 is the worst thing that could ever happen. Sure. Oh my God. Right, but that's right. like, that's but, subjective to. Yeah. But for me, as I said, like number one, first thing ever, I'm a father. Yeah, yeah. And so for somebody else, this will not feel like a failure, but it, it, this is the biggest one for me. And it's quite personal. Uh, but July, July 2020, yeah. I moved to LA yeah. by myself. My wife was pregnant with our second son, the one that has Down syndrome. And I moved to LA knowing that after she has the baby in Utah for insurance reasons, yeah. that after the baby's all good and cleared up, we're all just going to move to LA as a family. Because we knew our school's done. I'm done with school. I'm going to pursue my music career in LA. It, it was, was like, like that's a what thought it was. Out yeah. So I was like, step. I'm going to do this a little bit early before the baby is born so we can be together forever, like as a, not forever, but I mean like be together as a family in LA. Right, right, right. I did that. And they were supposed to be back. Baby was due in October. We were supposed to be back by a family. We were going to go. The point was we were going to spend time with my parents in for Christmas, for the holidays. Yeah. And then we would move together as a family to LA. That was the plan. Yeah. And then shit hit the fan. And this is where my biggest mistake come in. And I don't think this is a mistake. I think it was like partially inevitable. Mm. But I, I feel and, and felt, I, I'm a lot better with it now, but I felt horrendous about it. For eight months while I was in the hospital, uh-huh. my wife and my oldest, uh-huh. Um, lived with my parents, who oh. we now know was pretty abusive to my wife. I didn't know the full oh breadth God. of that until the depth of that until then. But um, uh, during that time, I came home for the first few months. I came home once a month for like a week, and because I was started the studio, I started my studio in the mix studios in August with my business partner Lou. Holy fuck. So like the next month after I landed, next month, um, and. Uh, during that once a month visit, um, I then found out that my father was very abusive to my wife. And so we cut off complete ties with them. So we left their home and I had to pay double rent. While this was happening, I had roommate issues where he had, I gave him a couple clients, my roommate, a couple clients. He screwed them over both two people so badly that they both came back as death threats to me. Oh God. So it's like, and like we were planning on living together as a family, like my family, four, pe- four people plus the two of them. Um, but 
after that for obvious reasons. Yeah. Like, yo, you can't be doing that. Like yeah. now, that now there's literally people stalking us that know where we live. Yeah. Because oh, you did the it. business in our apartment. Oh no. So that was out. Um, and so like this is all going down, right? This everything. So I'm I literally went, I got a, a, a shitty studio apartment in Utah, and then I went uh voluntarily homeless in LA for like three months. Oh and I didn't tell God. anybody this. I pretended that I had a place because I didn't want people to worry about me. And so I lived out of the studio and there luckily there's a shower in the studio yeah. and like I go and then I started after they moved into the apartment no longer with my parents to take care of them. I flew to Utah yeah. every weekend. So now I was there every weekend. So anyway, there's and then he finally had open heart surgery and and then he got out of the NICU after like 7 months of uh, he got open heart surgery 6 months, got out a month later, but then he had to like do all this therapy stuff for a few months later. So it wasn't until like almost a year after a little bit less than a year after that he finally came over. Like to, we finally were able to move to LA as a family. During that year when I didn't spend time with my family, um it was interesting. I've I've had uh, a, I've attempted to kill myself before when I was a junior in high school. Um, this is before I found passion due to many different things and expectations. We'll just say, yeah, uh, not a big deal. I, I, I this is it's not meant to be dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I have experience knowing what it means to be suicidal. <laughs> oh my god! And during that time, it was a it was the most different form of suicidal that I've ever had. It was, I want to die because this fucking sucks. Uh huh. And it would just be easier to die. Uh, but uh, I have a wife and kids that depend on me. Yeah. So I'm not. I. That's not an option. For, yeah, that's not an option. Yeah. So I was like mentally like just fucked. Oh, and, God. And, and during this time, because I was like by myself in LA, I did a week of work. There's 168 hours a week. <laughs> I worked 160 hours one week. I slept eight hours in one week. I did like, I think I did like two or three all-nighters. And when I say all-nighters, I was in like, I didn't sleep until the next night. Oh, and God. that that on top of all the stress, like that's that was the least healthy thing I could have ever done. That's like ever. expert mode on expert mode on oh, expert mode. I, that, like that. And then on top of that, I didn't see my oldest son. I missed a whole year of his life, basically. So to be the family man and to lose that much family and to put your family and I, through that accidentally. And I did exactly what my dad did and every dad does, which is continue to be a workaholic in the name of my family, in the name of providing oh for my family. Oh my God. So I guess, holy fuck. Yeah. I wasn't ready. Yeah, uh, that was probably the worst thing that I've ever done. It was inevitable. Well, like I didn't I, really have a choice. Well, my but. my my uh the reason that I asked that holy god was uh what you learned from that. Right? Cuz like if you were somebody who's so oh. afraid or for, so doesn't fear failures, I wanted to know what you've learned from your worst failure and then your best failure. Holy fuck though. Yeah, that was like, a deep one. I'm sorry, but um, No, I mean I'm sorry. I like I hope that so that wasn't much from that. Yeah. The w number one thing I don't know anybody that's my age or anybody substantially older than me that's in this industry where you cannot afford to limit yourself to working only 30 to 40 hours a week, you know? Uh, uh. I have fucking boundaries out the wazoo. I will Holy. say no to uh, oh my God. Uh, like a lot of my clients. I will not work past midnight. I don't care if you're Trey Songs. Like I literally yeah. did sessions with Trey Songs and that was probably <laughs> the last time that I worked past midnight. Wow. Um, I committed to not doing that anymore. Um, so like I have crazy about like I'm 28. Dog. Uh, I'm 28 and have the boundaries of a 70 year old dude. Dude, that's you know it, what I'm saying. But that's crazy because in that failure now for the rest of your life you will have family values that you have always you know oh, like like yeah like that's fucking crazy like, even in that. Literally two nights ago, my wife and I we had like a tear filled deep conversation as we were laying in bed about to go to bed about how sad she was and about how she has a hard time being happy. And then at the end of that, after listening and trying to be a good husband, I, I suck at listening, but I tried to do. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, I was, I kind of laughed. And she's like, why are you laughing? This is so serious to me. And I was like, I'm so glad that you not allowing yourself to be happy is the reason for your unhappiness. And like, that's it. Like, I'm so glad that we've gotten to a point where that's the reason why you're unhappy. And it's not because I haven't fucking seen you in a year. 
You know what I'm saying? Dude, you have me so fucked so up on like, this episode. Like, and so like literally after all of this, the thing that I learned the most is how to be fucking grateful. I love my family. And, and this goes into another thing too, like how I perceive success now dramatically change. It's not money. It's not fame. It's not any followers on Instagram. My success is how happy I am when I look into my kids' eyes. Oh my God. You know what I'm saying? Like that's <laughs> success to me. Like if I can look in my kid's eye and not feel bad that I haven't been there for them, that I feel like I've been a good part of your life. You know, that's happiness to me. And everything else, like the money and the fame and the Grammy or whatever is going gonna, is gonna to come over time. Yeah, this is, this is deep, huh? But dude, I'm dead serious. you got me fucked up. So I am, I'm, the thing that I learned the most is how to be like genuinely yeah. grateful. Wow. Like I thought I was grateful before. Yeah. But now I'm like, I can be stoic. Like I could, oh, I have, a, yeah, I have like, a chance at reaching nirvana. Right you're now. like full stoicism. Like yeah, you like, fucking know. I really don't give a shit. Like, <laughs> and Holy it's like, it's actually fuck. helped me be more assertive too. Like with yeah. clients and yeah, whatnot. Like, yeah. no, you're not smoking around me. I don't allow that. Wow. And like, wow. it's like, I'll be brave. Right. And, and because I, what do I have to lose? You not being a client? Well, I didn't want clients like you anyway. <laughs> Dude, like you, have, <laughs> you have seen the lowest of the lows. So now like there's just nothing like the volume is so different which the noise oh, which i'm gonna end it with this and Please. i think my my perception of heaven if the point of heaven uh, or something like heaven uh, is to have the ultimate form of happiness yeah then i think that it has to include the ultimate form of misery it has to or else you will never be able to fully appreciate at least with the human mind you will never be able to fully appreciate. I don't think I've ever been happier in my life, but it only came because I've been the worst in my life, like the unhappiest in my life. And, and now, like literally, like I literally looked at my wife in her fucking face that I love her so much and like laughed that her problem was she couldn't let herself be happy. Yeah. Like that's so amazing. I was grateful. Yeah. When she said I'm unhappy, I felt gratitude. And it was like a really surreal. This happened like two days ago. Oh it was like a really surreal moment for me. I was like, wow, like I'm happy. Yo, fuck, if, I'm happy. That's if what I'm you're heard. watching this podcast, not listening, like the last 10 minutes of me just being shook. Just, me, <laughs> <laughs> just holy, like, uh. Yeah. So that's what I learned. Oh my fucking God, dude. I, I wasn't ready. I mean, I, I wasn't ready. Let's be honest. I wasn't ready Dude. when that shit happened. I was, they were supposed to be with me New Year's. Oh my God. It's, you know, what's crazy to me though, is like not necessarily how wrong I got you, but like I'm over here. Like I didn't know you before this. Right. And I'm like this fucking business mastermind over here, figuring out all these things. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. I studied it. I don't give a fuck. Like, let me tell you about what matters is family. Like it's crazy to me that like I assumed that you would be obsessed with like the, the intricacies and the nuances and the that because I viewed you to be so good at it. And you're like, yeah, 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 that's cool. But here's what matters. And like, I, I, I'm learning a lesson in real time of that. And it's just nuts to me as well. Yeah. I, yeah, it, it's, it's been a long way. And I don't think I'm all the way there yeah. as far as like, I think I have a lot more to learn. Yeah. And I have a lot more mistakes to make. Yeah. Um, but again, like the way that I kind of see myself coming back to the business side of it and, yeah. and, and in life too, is that I think the only reason... I'm grateful that you think I have any insight. And if you're mm. listening now, like I'm really, really, really grateful that anybody thinks that I have any level of insight that's worth learning anything from. I'm, I'm grateful for anybody that's listening. But I do think that where all of my relative success and relative happiness comes from is because I am one of the best mistake makers. Right. I am a professional fuck up. That's what I am. <laughs> Like I, I, I think so, and and not professional as in for monetary gain. Yeah, but also personal development. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very good at fucking up, and I fucked up young. I fucked up a lot, and I fucked up young. Yeah. Most people don't get married and have to learn how to deal with a wife yeah. when you're poor. Uh huh. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. like when you're uh -huh. 21 and you're both in college and you're poor. Oh, dude, insane. There's things that I learned from that that most people who are smart and wait to get married. 
till they're older will never learn. Right. I will have a deeper connection with my wife for those specific times that yeah. nobody else who was smart enough to wait will ever learn. Crazy. Yeah. No, you're and, so right. And so it's things like that. Like, and there are things that I'm afraid of. I'm not going to pretend like I'm some super, super person. But. Right. But like, I, I guess like my, my, to make that actionable because I'm so inspired by that, mm -hmm. like for myself and for any listener, like how do I get better at fucking up? What's your advice to that? Hmm. That's a great question. I think exactly what you said that you believe so firmly earlier is following your gut. I feel like most of the time when I fuck up mm. is when I wanted to just try something. Mm. Like, like I never overthought it. In mm. Japan, people have this thing where they overprepare. They want to get into bicycling, but yeah. they won't start yeah. until they saved up the money to buy a bike uh -huh. and buy the outfit uh -huh. and the gloves and the uh -huh. helmet and everything. And it's like pro. But, like but in America, what makes America so great and so uh innovational mm. Inno innovative sorry innovative, innovative that's the right yeah, word innovative yeah. is uh is the idea that if you wanted to start skating you don't give a shit if it's a walmart skateboard or something you grab from your friend's backyard it totally. feels rotting you know totally you're yeah. gonna figure out a way to fix it yeah. and skate right of course and i think that aspect is so healthy and we kind of lose that over time so i think for you and for anybody listening being more aware of your gut. Mm. And even if it's very small, like a small, like, hey, I want to try this. Just go for it. Mm. There's nothing to lose. Mm. And if you find out you suck at it or you don't like it, then you know never to waste your time on that again. You can then, instead of going left, you can turn right and know that right is so certain. Yeah. Or you might find the thing that either makes you the most money or produces the most amount of happiness. Follow-up question, when do you know it's a failure? For somebody who has gotten so good at fucking up and failing, when do you quantify something as a failure? I think for me, it's when I stop enjoying it. Again, I'm not doing it for money. So like if something starts to go negative, I usually pivot, right? In ways yeah. that makes it go. So like that's part of the fun of it, yeah. you know? Is like So the innovating. test is when it stops being Yeah, fun. so it's like, yeah, I think that's when I stop. Yeah. And it's not that I don't stop because like, for example, like, I still skateboard, you know, I still uh -huh. longboard. Uh -huh. So is that a failure? I don't know if it was a failure that Probably I just quit, not. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, something that you stopped investing that amount of time into. And granted, like, there's so many different things that I've done that now I'm just a human friend to anybody. Like, I'm just a friend to anybody. Yeah. Like, because I can, re there's, you bring me someone that I genuinely cannot relate to. Yeah. And I will give you a hundred yeah, like, dollars. Yeah, yeah. like, like there's nobody in this world that I will have no way to relate to. <laughs> right. Like, yo, like yeah. there's so many different things that. No, that's beautiful. Sucks. That's so beautiful. Like when it stops being fun. That's, yeah, I think that's it. You, you. I don't think there's anything deeper than that. Yeah, your two like bars that you dropped so simply was the "What will I do forever for free." And you stop when it stops being fun. Like we covered some fucking life. <laughs> but those two like simple things that I could think about in a single sentence and be like, fuck, like that's so powerful to me, mm. dude. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I, I, and to that, I say um, thank you for valid, feel, making me feel validated. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but fuck. also like yeah. I'm glad that I was able to be of, uh, of help or of benefit to anybody yeah yeah and i really like i mean if you're still listening to this podcast like, I, I genuinely hope that this helped and I, I hope that like what stood out to me about that six figure episode was how how willing you were to share and again in like some much more meaningful shit here you were again willing to share i don't think i've ever shared anything this deep in any <laughs> public platform ever you got me fucked up bro yeah I've, uh this is interesting i'm gonna Wow, this you you're a great host, bro. Uh, you got me into a uh, deep place. I wasn't ready. I wasn't you got, ready. You did. I, I guess so <laughs> fuck this sounds so it, it, it feel the scope of it just feels wrong, but for to conclude like so if people did find help from this and enjoyed it, like where is the best way for people to find you or what are you paying attention to now or what like what's how could somebody hit you up and be like, "Yo, fucking thank you"? Or what should they pay attention to of yours? Uh, yeah, Instagram is great, but yeah. if you you can just email me too. Yeah. Uh, both Instagram and email is DK Mixes, mm. uh, D E E K E I Mixes, and then my email is just DK Mixes at Gmail. Nice. Yeah, nice. you can just hit me up. 
<laughs> thank you dude holy shit thank you she was fucking crazy this is therapy for me so i appreciate it yeah well thank you for sharing this i, I really hope it helps people it certainly helped me so there you go dk's story holy crap what a story that was i have so much respect for him after really learning about his life and him sharing so much, being willing to share that much personal advice and lessons and perspective. Like, talk about keeping it real. I, I really do respect that. So I hope you got a lot out of this one. I hope that it inspired you and gave you some amount of new wisdom or perspective. It certainly did for me. If it did, do me a couple favors. One, shoot him a message and let him know because that would mean a lot to me. You can find him in all of his projects and everything that he's up to just by going to his Instagram, which is at DK Mixes. So D-E-E-K-E-I-M-I-X-E-S. It's also linked in the episode description. Then after that, hit me up, let me know what you thought of it and share it with a friend. Because if you got value out of this, I would love for a friend of yours to also get value out of it. And if you want to go above and beyond, you can rate it anywhere where you were listening and watching. Spotify has a rating thing now. Apple, uh, YouTube, anywhere that you listen or watch, give it a rating, a thumbs up, whatever. Outside of that, let me know other guests that you want to hear from. And most importantly, thank you for listening. It means so much. I'll be back next week with another episode.